Hello and welcome to a concept review module on remote sensing. I'm Ann Johnson, an associate director of the Geotech Center, which is a national science funded grant to empower, help empower colleges and grow the workforce. I want to stress that this is a review of remote sensing concepts and it's not to go into depth and we'll show you some more resources if you need more information. But we're going to talk a bit about what it is and how it's used platforms versus sensors, and we'll in review a few of the more important co science concepts. We'll also look at data or imagery, and what does it look like? We'll talk about different resolutions that are needed for remote sense data, and review briefly classification and object identification using remote sensing. But in, again, there are additional resources included at the end of this module. So remote sensing, what is it and how is it used? Well, we see it quite often if you watch uh, uh, weather maps at all, either on, on the internet or on the television, you can uh, see data that has been collected by satellites to tell us what the weather is going to be like. We can look you use it uh, if you've got imagery over change uh, time. You can look at different time frames and see how changes have occurred. We're studying the climate and weather using remote sensing, and if geology is using it to locate um, earthquakes, volcanoes, faults, and min mining. Natural disasters right now, there's been a lot of wildfires going on, and we get remote sense data from MODIS that shows hot spots, and you can see where fires are starting or expanding or have uh, uh, are not expanding anymore. Of course, a farmer can take a look at his farm and see what uh, is going on too, where things are healthy or stressed or needs more water. This is a definition from the U.S. Geological Survey about remote sensing, and in general, it is using data about a natural feeder, feature or phenomenon without actually being in contact with it. There are many platforms that can carry remote sensing sensors. And these are just some examples of drones or satellites, aerial imaging, helicopters, and even land vehicles can be used to, uh, as a platform for sensors. And these can have more than one sensor. They can have multi different kinds of sensors on them. And these sensors can have be of two general types. One uh, that uses uh, uh, the sun's energy to uh, collect data. Uh, we'll talk about those and how it works. They're passive sensors. The other ones are active sensors where you actually have to add a source of energy in order to collect it. And the different devices and sensors can use radio waves, laser beams. And even if you think about it, your digital camera is a passive sensor when it's using the energy of the sun. But in a dark room, you add a flash and the flash makes it then an active sensor. This is the introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it's a very good um, tutorial that NASA has put out. I would highly suggest taking a view of it. It really does show all of the different types of uh, electromagnetic uh, data that we are uh, subject to. This is a graphic uh, that uh, is part of that uh, NASA tutorial, and it really shows the wavelengths, the frequency of the wavelengths, so how many times it passes a, a, a position, say the frequency here is shown as one second, or its wavelength, the distance between two crests. As you uh, increase the frequency and, and shorten the wavelength, the energy increases. And we're most interested in that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum here, and we're going to look at it in more detail, called the optical window. So this is a, a blown up version of the same thing. And we're going to be looking at both the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but also the remote sensing will be collecting uh, data from areas that we can't visually see in that optical window. The shaded areas here are atmospheric blocks to that data, and you can see that it does open up in several areas. The human eye is actually a passive uh, sensor. 
It collects reflected energy from the sun off of objects, and our eyes collect it, our brain processes it, and we visualize an image that we're seeing using that energy. As stressed earlier, humans can only see a very small part of the electromagnetic energy, and that part of it then uh, we can visualize is useful, but there are other parts that we can use sensors to artificially collect that data. This is another graphic, and unfortunately, it does exactly the opposite. It's the good parts that let in uh, electromagnetic uh, energy are not are shaded in this one. So here we can look at three different satellite examples: Landsat 7, Landsat 8, and Sentinel 2, and see what areas that each of their sensors and the numbers represent the sensors. So here on Sentinel we see sensors 1 through 12, there are different sensors collecting data in that specific region. We can see Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. So here, this is the area within the electromagnetic spectrum where the atmosphere lets the sensor collect those data spots. This is just an example from passive remote sensing components using the satellite. So here we have the energy of the sun at A, the targets on the ground, some of it is absorbed, some scattered, some then is reflected from those objects, a satellite at the top of the atmosphere collects it, and if it's close to a satellite receiving station, it will send it down, otherwise it will record it, and when it goes over that station again, it will send it down. It goes into a center that uh, a human being actually does do some collecting and, and correcting on it, and then it's produced and uh, made available over the internet. LiDAR is a little different. It's active remote sensing, and it has, there's an excellent tutorial from NOAA on the LiDAR tutorial. Uh, so we have an uh, airplane that's going to be uh, collecting a swath, an angle, and a single laser shot down, and it will send out returns and collect the returns on that. So first return, of course, would probably be hitting the, the tops of things, and the last return would be hitting the ground. And this is very useful because we can then uh, differentiate these return readings to actually visualize and see what the ground looks like. So LIDAR and archaeology has been very useful. Um, many of the places are overgrown with vegetation. Uh, it's very hard to see the objects, but if you can use LIDAR, you can get that last return and see the ground surface where you wouldn't be able to see it through the trees. So remote sensing imagery has uh, different resolutions of data, and we're going to talk briefly about the four important ones. The first one is spatial resolution. It's the area or the size on the ground covered by one pixel, or sometimes it's the area covered by an image footprint. Spectral resolution is the ability of a sensor to collect and record energy in a defined wavelength interval of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we were looking at those uh, areas that from Landsat and Sentinel where you could record that energy in, in a defined wavelength. Radiometric resolution is really the sensitivity of the sensor to discriminate very different, small differences in that energy. And some of them have better uh, radiometric resolutions. Landsat 7 has one radiometric resolution, but has been greatly increased the sensitivity in Landsat 8, and you can really see the difference. Temporal resolu resolution is just how often the data is being co collected. Uh, if you're flying a drone, it just depends on how often you want to fly it. But for satellites, it's often uh, to its orbit, what, what orbit, and we're going to talk about orbital locations and the temporal resolution. For more concepts on uh, remote sensing resolutions and better explanations of these four different uh, terms, it, there's a concept review module. So temporal re resolution, like I mentioned, 
is often for satellites uh, based on the orbit. So Landsat 8 is in a polar orbit. It's going circling the Earth uh, polar to pole. If you see the little uh, pathways, the stripes on the right, where the GO satellite is a stationary or orbit and the Earth is going around. So it's a one day repeat where polar orbit gives a temporal resolution of every 16 days is covered uh, by the same place. One thing, what does raw data look like? I know the first time I saw a remote image, it was gray, and I couldn't figure out exactly what I was looking at. This is just an example of uh, uh, Landsat 8 bands, 30 meter pixels. So the pixel resolution, the spatial resolution is 30 meters. And each one of the uh, sensors provides a um, image in grayscale based on the pixel brightness for each of the pixels. When you get it, you get all of the different data sets and this changes over time. So, but this happens to be an example from Landsat 8 and the different bands and yeah, it comes in tarred and you have to unzip it twice and it's a very large up to a gigabyte. When you do get it and you look at one of the bands, this is a uh, band grayscale la layer from Landsat 8. And uh, it's very useful, but it's when you combine it with more than one image in different colored formats. Uh, we'll take a look at the composite images, but this is what it looks like. So if I take and look at that same one and I look at the energy levels or the digital numbers for each of them, I can go in, I can zoom in. So Landsat 8 band 4 in this scene. And as I zoom in, I can see the pixels. And these are 30 meter pixels. And I can see the brightness. And I can continue to zoom in till I see one 30 meter pixel. And I can actually get the digital number of it. So this is exactly what that Landsat uh, band 4 scene would look like if you zoomed in on it. What you can do, though, on your computer monitor is take three bands, any three bands, and assign them to a color gun on your computer monitor and assign that band either to the red, to the green, or the blue color channel. And you can create composite images. The top one is a natural color composite image. The middle one is a pseudo color image and the bottom a false color image and then the pseudo color image. It helps to be able to combine different bands. You can see different things. You can definitely see uh, greenness or uh, buildings or natural occurring things depending on which bands you pick. There are methods though for looking at it and classifying what you're seeing. And two methods uh, that are used are supervised and unsupervised classification and then object-based classification. These are three different techniques. Supervised and unsupervised use in one way. Uh, the computer will actually um, pick uh, like pixels and put them together and then you decide what you think they are. Or you can uh, create a, a sample set that you believe is water or mountains or whatever and, and tell it to put them into groups that way, cluster them. One that's becoming more and more um, useful is the object-based classification. And here it takes all those pixels and using various rules that can be set up, such as shape or texture, color, graphic context, and, and actually define what they believe those features are. This is another thing you can do with those bands. You can actually do what's called band algebra. So there's a, an equation for NDVI, normalized vegetation index, where you take two bands, the near infrared plus the red, and divide by the near infrared minus the red. And it gives you a um, composite image that shows you, in this case, the greenness. The green things are, uh, vegetation, the reds and the yellows are either built up or are non-vegetated things. 
You can also look at individual pixels. This is just an example using Landsat Explorer, but you can do it with your imagery. Here you focus in on one pixel and it will actually tell you all of the values of the data that was collected for that pixel and graph it for you. These are called spectral uh, signatures and here we're seeing a spectral signature as being identified as forest. So this graph is one that sh should indicate a, a trees ground cover, but these graphs can be taken at two different times. So the graph on the upper right is two different times, one where the area, the, the pixel is showing healthy sugar beets, and then later uh, unstressed or not healthy. Uh, there is a library of different uh, classification spectral signatures that you can use to identify different things, so clear water, water with phytoplankton, soils, uh, healthy vegetation, or rocks. So you can use the spectral signatures of a pixel to identify various types of features. This is some of the additional resources that I was talking about earlier, the National NASA tour of the electromagnetic electromagnetic spectrum, but there's also the Natural Resources Canada Remote Sensing Tutorial. I get was another grant and that there are several YouTube videos with modules that are specific to things about remote sensing. And then there's additional Geotech Center Concepts modules on remote sensing resolutions. Also there are, is a model course on remote sensing. Uh, I'm Ann Johnson. If you have any comments, please get back to me uh, and thank you so much.